Can you turn on subtitles? Can you turn on subtitles? John's trying to do it, David. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to do that, David, at the moment. Um, so good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this joint meeting between Justice for Palestinians Levington Spa and the Mid-Warwickshire Amnesty International branch. Um, my name is Andy Smith. I'm one of the co-coordinators with Belinda Pike uh, of the JFP group in Leamington. Um, we're um, really pleased to welcome you to this joint meeting. First time we've done a joint one with Amnesty, I think. And um, we're reaping the rewards in terms of numbers. So it's great to see so many of you um, online. Um, and um, the timing is, is very good. This, this report that Gary's going to talk about um, came out very recently. Um, and I hope some of you managed to look at the 15-minute um, video that um, Belinda shared the link to, which if you haven't had a chance to see it, we'll perhaps send it around again <laughs> afterwards. Uh, it um, just gives you a bit of a summary overview with, with visuals of, of the main sort of findings of the report and uh, makes for rather depressing viewing, but important viewing nonetheless. Um, so um, if you'd like to ask questions, Gary is going to talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have roughly 40 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, the best thing is if you use the chat function to um, type your question in so that uh, Gary can actually see it during the course of the um, talk. And if he wants to pick anything up, he can, he can do that then. But otherwise, we'll, we'll come back to you at, at the end and uh, possibly invite you to unmute and, and ask your question in your own voice. It makes it a bit more interactive. Um, and as I say, we are recording this. And I think that's all you need to know from me. So. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Gary, who's the volunteer coordinator or volunteer country coordinator, sorry, for Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories for Amnesty. He's, he's visited, visited Israel Palestine five times, um, mostly acting as a, a human shield essentially for olive farmers, preventing their trees being bulldozed and God knows whatever else the settlers and IDF get up to. Um, so, um, brave man. And um, very interested to hear what you've got to tell us, Gary. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. I mean, you're, you're, you're first up as regards people who've requested uh, talks about the Amnesty report. So uh, I, you're testing me out and I'm testing you out as well. So we'll see how it goes. Um, the presentation is uh, one that was produced by the office. I, I usually produce my own PowerPoint presentations on various aspects of Israel, Palestine, the issues there. Uh, and I can talk on any, any particular aspect if, if you want in the future. But as regards to this uh, report, they have produced uh, a, a talk which I've gladly grasped at, given I was on holiday, so I had little time to prepare. <laughs> um, and I've just inserted some videos as well. Now, given the timeline, I might actually just show one of those videos rather than two. They are brief, they're five minutes each, but they do give the Palestinians a chance to, to give their own voice to, uh, to the issue, really, uh, rather than just me talking for, for Amnesty, let the Palestinians talk for themselves. Um, there is nothing new about this report. The, the main content of it, I mean, 80, 90% of it are facts, or issues, or events, or incidents, or policies, practices that Amnesty has been looking at over the last 50 years. Now, if you've, you've had, obviously had an interest in, in the area, then you'll be aware of, of much of uh, the material that's in the Amnesty report. Um, it, it details in, well, it goes into great detail on the policies and the practices um, of the Israeli authorities um, in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, and also it spreads into, into Israel um, in terms of the discrimination against the Palestinians as an as a identifiable group. Um, and to the extent that uh, now the last four years, there's been a greater intensity in terms of amnesty looking at whether the, the aspects of the occupation, as we were calling it, um, were actually fulfilling the criteria for uh, entitling it an, an apartheid situation. So this has taken four years to come to this point where Amnesty felt it done sufficient research, uh, had sufficient um, reviews done um, and sufficient uh, external legal uh, oversight of, of the arguments to confidently go forward with a report stating that um, uh, Israel's um, policy towards the Palestinians equates to an apartheid situation. So this hasn't been arrived at quickly. 
Um, one thing that gave it quite a big spin was in 2018, the nation state law, which uh, Israel introduced, which basically states that the state of Israel is the state of, uh, is, the, is a Jewish state, um, which excludes the 20% of uh, the population who are not Jewish, they're Israeli Arabs. Um, that really gave a, the biggest spin to, uh, for the ne next four years, for Amnesty to really have a really um, close look at the situation there. So that's the very rough background. As I say, I'll, I'll spin through the presentation as quickly as I can. Um, as I say, if you've got a chance to, to watch the video, that does help as well, because this very much puts in words what you can see in, in, uh, in speech and, and pictures on, on that video. Um, and then obviously the Q and A at the end, hopefully we'll be able to clarify um, any concerns or questions you've got. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cross my fingers and share my screen so you'll be able to see the presentation. Um, I need a host to actually enable the share, screen sharing. I'm not able to do it because I need the chair to enable me to share the screen. Okay, Gary, that should be enabled now. Sorry. Okay, great. And can I suggest those of you with your cameras on might turn them off now while Gary's screen sharing because it'll... Uh, Reduce the bandwidth and you won't be visible anyway. Okay. Um, so launching into it, as I said, it's been four years of research. This isn't it hasn't been a quick thing. Nothing with Amnesty is quick. A lot of detailed research is done with all Amnesty's work. So this is no exception, and particularly so with this issue. It's 300 pages long, but again, I say don't be intimidated. A lot of the content you'll be aware of is the uh, the events um, and the incidents and the policies and practices that you'll be familiar with if you've, you've known about Palestine and Israel over the last 50 years or more. 51 recommendations at the end are quite detailed and address uh, Israel, obviously, the Israeli authorities in, in various aspects of uh, the apartheid state, and also uh, third parties, international governments, the UN, businesses so anybody that can actually have an impact on this and change the situation uh, there are recommendations for those those organizations and individuals now obviously the definition of apartheid was a thing that uh, is amnesty had to ensure it was matching in terms of uh, the situation on the ground um there, there are key words used in terms of um inhumane acts, so it's institutionalized, so it involves uh, many aspects of the state being used against uh, the identified group. It's oppressive, it's, uh, the intent is to dominate. Um, and in this case, we're talking about a domination that's been over at least the 50 years since the 67 war, and um, prior to that, obviously from 48. So the, what's uh, been decided is that the intent has been to dominate and oppress uh, that group, the Palestinians, over that time, it's been done in a systematic way and in an institutional manner. And it say it has it doesn't have to include violence. Um, it can involve the denial of basic rights and freedoms, um, which can be in terms of house demolitions and um, freedom of movement being curtailed greatly. So it doesn't have to involve violence. Now, what the report has found is that uh, there is a system of apartheid being operated against Palestine and you'll note against the Palestinian refugees because they are not allowed to return. Um, I don't know if irony is the right word, but you've got Israel welcoming thousands of, or hundreds of thousands, potentially Ukrainian refugees um, from now, um, when there are actually hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees been sitting on their doorstep with an entitlement to return home um, since 1948. It was requested in you know, the years after 48 by the UN that the Palestinians were allowed to return and they never have been allowed. And that's furthermore, we're talking about the segregation and the, the inferior, the, treating the Palestinians as an inferior racial group. Um, they're an identifiable group in terms of not race so much as their culture, their language, and their customs. You know, they're identifiable as a, a group separate from um, the Israeli Jewish community. And the conclusion is, as I say, that we have the definition of apartheid being met under international law with the situation in Israel-Palestine. And as I say, going back, uh, this is dating from 48, um, where the various laws that were in existing then, which were actually a lot of them were British laws at the time, 
to control the Palestinian population. Those were maintained and have morphed under the Israeli uh, authorities over years and been developed and worked on, uh, with later laws coming in, as we'll see. And the important thing is, though, that all this is with the intent, there's been an intent to privilege Jewish Israelis at the expense of, expense of Palestinians. And so that's about expanding the, uh, the area that is under Israeli authority. So the, the means by which this has been achieved, fragmentation, the details will come up after this, but fragmentation of domains of control. So we're talking about the Palestinian uh, as a population being split into Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and, uh, and within Israel itself. Now, the notable thing with recent with the troubles in uh, May last year was the, the actual unification of um, the feelings of the Palestinians, where there are reactions right across the Palestinian communities across those four areas from Gaza to East Jerusalem, uh, um, objecting to what was happening. First of all, it blew out of what was happening in East Jerusalem. Then you have the, the conflict that then flared up in Gaza. So there was actually a, a connection between all those portions of the Palestinian population despite the attempted fragmentation over the years by Israel. Segregation and control, again, I won't dwell too much on these because the details are coming up. Displacement of landed properties, so we're talking about land laws as well as house demolitions, home demolitions, and the economic and social rights. We're talking about uh, deficits on the economic, the, the education and welfare and movement and culture all those things that are uh, stifled by the Israeli apartheid state. Now going into a bit more detail, fragmentation. You can see the map on the right there. I don't know if you can be able to read the small print, but uh, it shows you the different ways in which um, the Palestinian population has been fragmented in those four areas. Um, fragmented and controlled and kept, maintained and kept apart by various permit laws. So there was obviously that displacement which occurred originally in 48 and then in 67. And that uh, dispersal from, from those conflicts um, has been maintained. The following those, uh, those hostilities, there has been no right of return for Palestinians as opposed to the right of return for any Jewish person around the world to, to return, quote unquote, to Israel. Settlement building, which is further exacerbating you know, the, the restricted um, uh, access and uh, living space for Palestinians in the West Bank. Segregation aspects, um, the nationality status, which does not exist for any Palestinian, including the Palestinians living in Israel. They have a uh, citizenship uh, status, but they do not have a nationality status in Israel. So although you will hear that, well, you know, they have the same rights as everybody else in Israel, that is not the case. Um, this is the, the, the basis that they do not have nat uh, Israeli nationality. They are exempt from military service. Now you may say that's uh, some benefit possibly, why would they want to serve in Israeli forces? But the, 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 uh, the huge downside for them is in terms of the status of somebody who has served in the Israeli Defense Force. That comes with a number of privileges once you have done your national service. And all those uh, benefits and advantages um, are not available to the Palestinians. So it's a bit of a double-edged thing, but that exists. The permit system, again, that's to do with the fragmentation, not being allowed to, to move between the four different areas of uh, the Palestinian um, territories, you know, Gaza, East Jerusalem, Israel, and, and the West Bank. Of family unification, which is a sub part of that, which is uh, you may have seen in the last few days that the uh, Knesset, the Israeli parliament, has, has reintroduced, and uh, it's been something that's been running since 2003, a law which denies um, the uh, permission for uh, a, the spouse of a Palestinian to actually move from, it, move from elsewhere in the Palestinian territories. So if, uh, if an Israeli Arab marries or has a relationship with the West Bank, Palestinian Arab or Gaza or East Jerusalem uh, uh, Arab, then Palestinian, they, they cannot join them in Israel. And uh, that works across the four areas. <coughs> and military law and courts, which only operate for Palestinians. And that's largely in the West Bank, obviously. It does not apply to the Israeli settlers that are in the West Bank, it only applies to Palestinians. 
and the restrictions on right to political participation in protest. That's the, obviously the suppression of uh, any activity by uh, Palestinians in any uh, significant way to, to represent their views or to protest, to have meetings. Military Order 101 is, uh, is a notorious order used in the West Bank, which does not permit uh, assembly marches or the use of emblems or flags uh, by the Palestinians to, to uh, protest their rights. Dispossession, this is getting down to the land and property. Um, these are the number of ways in which uh, homes and land have been lost across uh, Israel-Palestine to the Palestinians over the years since 48, um, with, a, with a raft of laws that have been introduced. There is uh, original ordinances from 43, which inherited by the, the British, which, uh, which seized uh, Palestinian land and uh, that's never been, uh, been retrieved. Absentee, absentee properties, the people who fled in 48 who didn't come back, those lands have been, uh, been transferred to the state so that that's no longer accessible to them. And a further land acquisition law in 53 with a similar impact. Um, if a Palestinian is not actually tending that land, even though he might not be able to be given access to it, you know, he's not able to, to get it even though he wants to, um, that will be reacquired by the Israeli state. And the result of that has been those figures there, which from 90% ownership, they've been reduced to 3 to 3.5%. On the deprivation uh, scales, let's take it one at a time if we can. The Gaza goes with it, it's, it's the extreme, really, in terms of the denial of. Uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, and also the right to life, right to health, right to education, you name it. The Gazans are, are, are um, denied that right by the siege, which has been going on uh, for 14 years now. And the denial of permits to build homes infrastructure in contrast to the expanding Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Um, you know, application of that's the 90 plus percent of applications by Palestinians are met with refusals. Uh, so therefore you get um, what are deemed to be illegal constructions by Palestinians to expand their houses, their villages, and they're immediately put under the threat of a uh, demolition. And then there's the equivalence um, in terms of what the state provides, Israeli state provides to Palestinians. And some of that, a lot of that applies actually to within Israel as well, in terms of what is supplied to Palestinian communities, local authorities in Israel. Um, and what is given to the, the Jewish authorities, Jewish local authorities. And as a result of all this for all the Palestinians, um, you know, anything on the, under the Palestinian Authority, it's, it has remained stagnant. It's gone to reverse at various points as well. And just one aspect, water, very, very critical. If that's the proper term, it's extreme critical to, to the water situation in the occupied territories, obviously in that region of the world, and is going to get increasingly so. Um, it's already massively um, indiscriminate, it's discriminating in terms of the distribution of water in the area. What I'm going to do, I'm, going to, I'm not going to use the next um, video, I'm going to skip past that one and go on to the one at the end. So the acts that fuel the system, we've got the, uh, the various human rights uh, violations that have occurred over the years. Uh, you talk about the excessive violence that's been used, uh, administrative detention, etc. As you can see, the forcible transfer, the torture of a mentioned the lawful killings. Hardly any of these are, you know, are, uh, are investigated in any meaningful way. They're committed by the IDF and investigated by the IDF and rarely are um, Witnesses outside of the IDF called for an investigation into uh, extrajudicial killings. Now, swiftly moving on to the campaign, I and mean, what this campaign is about, right, it's the idea is to make it more costly. This has always been the aim, really, of, of Amnesty's work for, for any country in the world where human rights and justices are taking place, to make it costly, to have some cost for, for the country, for the authorities that are actually. Uh, abusing the human rights. So in, the same, in this case, also the Israeli authorities um, were trying to find some way of making this uh, be a price for the Israelis to continue in with the policies they have. 
and also where individuals or groups stand up within Israel or Palestine to actually uh, defend them. Now that you'd be familiar with this because we've obviously been trying to do that over the years with individuals at risk. Now in terms of the objectives, so it's the initial stage in, is increasing awareness of the apartheid system. Now, initially that can be with, it's obviously with local groups with yourselves. So we're not launching into you, asking you to, to approach prime um, MPs, representatives at this point. We want to absorb the facts absorb as much of the report as you can or the salient parts of it. Um, so the, the, um, the reasoning for uh, stating Israel has an apartheid state. So it's become an awareness of that apartheid system for, for yourselves and for the public. So once you're aware of it and fully acquainted and comfortable with the, the report, <coughs> that you can actually um, then start to represent it to the public and spread the word. But also we're looking for third states to recognize the system. That if, it's an apartheid system. There, there is an obligation under the UN charters, under the apartheid uh, covenants, for third parties, other countries to actually investigate and, and take action where apartheid is, is seen to be operating. But obviously, we're then also obviously wanting the Israeli authorities to end the practices that actually produce the apartheid situation. Now, the main focus up until July, the focus is going to be on the home because we feel that actually makes it more personal with Palestinians. We can all have homes, what a home means to us in terms of our life so we can relax and, and live our own lives and be ourselves. The Palestinians are very much denied that. Um, so a lot of the uh, early parts of this campaign are going to be around that aspect. And we're thinking long term. This isn't going to be, uh, this is going to be a long haul. It's been a long haul up till now, but with apartheid, we know it's going to be a long haul. You all have seen from the international criticisms, um, you know, from Israel to the States, obviously, uh, but other places as well, Germany um, and the British government have not been sympathetic to our Amnesty's report. It's not the la it's not the first to, to state that Israel's system is apartheid. We know we've got Human Rights Watch, we've got Beth Salem within Israel, who have stated that it's an apartheid state. So it's going to take time. So we're talking about one or two years just for getting people to get their, wrap their heads around the fact that this is an apartheid state and that the amnesty report is going nowhere and they were expecting some activity. And then further action will take place over the, over the, next, uh, the next few years. But accountability, you can see how um, realistic amnesty is in terms of how quickly one can get change in this sort of situation. So we are talking about the long haul. That's not to get de depressed about that. It's just the fact this is going to be a long haul and it will mean chipping away and uh, spreading the publicity, getting people to accept it's an apartheid state in the first place, and then to recognize that there's an obligation to actually do something about that. For the UK specifically, what we're asking the UK government for is recognition that it's being committed. This is an old one, but we still want it. It's banning settlement goods. That should be already occurring. And also it's something that Amnesty has been calling for for some time in terms of suspending armed security equipment sales because of the way they're being used to, to underpin the, the apartheid state. To, this is to do with what the UN, the international obligations are to third parties. And this includes the UK, obviously, in terms of investigating uh, allegations of apartheid. <clears throat> and also bringing perpetrators to justice. So we would want this to be taken on board worldwide, but obviously with the UK for ourselves. And obviously leaning on the Israel in as many ways possible to get them to change the system, to amend the system at the very least, and really working towards getting rid of it ultimately, but certainly getting some movement on, on the way it's impacting the Palestinians day in, day out in their lives. Businesses are not forgetting. There's been a campaign the last couple of years, you'll probably remember, um, in terms of businesses that are actually uh, underpinning the, the settlements, certainly, um, in terms of the tourism industry and when, in all aspects, really engineering, electricity, you name it, every aspect of life, infrastructure and settlements, there, there can be um, international companies that are actually involved in sustaining those, uh, those systems. So we're asked them not to do that. Um, Sorry, this is very rapid, but uh, this is what we're asking you to do. There, there is an education module. I don't know if you've done it. I've done it, and it actually does actually start to embed things in your head. If you watch the video 
and then go to the education module, which is in the, uh, the link to resources um, on the AIUK site. Once you go into AIUK, then Israel-Palestine, and you'll go into the resource uh, page, which gives you these links. And the education module is there. And I do recommend that people, it takes about an hour and a half, or you can cut in and out of it, though you don't have to spend a full hour and a half on it in one go. And just dip into it to, to, to it gets you, it prompts you in terms of the aspects that Amnesty is looking at. The petition, the petition is still online. online. Obviously, to hold an event so when you feel able to and informed. And there is action coming up on the 21st of March. Um, <coughs> if I can dare to go into this link, that this link, or maybe I'm going to, it, it does, it's a toolkit for what you can possibly do on the 21st of March. It feels, I must admit, to me, it even feels to me now, that's actually quite short notice for groups, but um, this is when we're asking um, people to take some action um, as regards the apartheid report. And that's because it's um, it's the day for, it's the anniversary of the International Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, ICERD. Um, it's that, that day marks uh, racial discrimination elimination day, as it were. <clears throat> so we thought it'd be a good day to, to choose. I have to say it is short notice. Some groups are saying they are going to try things, at least online, if it's holding up things you know, online and uh, it doesn't have to be extravagant and elaborate in, in public, um, anything you can do on that date. So those are the things you can do at this point. So we're not asking for major action or significant action in terms of approaching representatives, MPs at this point. It's really just uh, assimilating the report and uh, to say signing the petition and educating yourselves. Now, what I'm going to do now is just show one five minute video and then we'll, we'll cut for questions and answers. So I'll go straight into this. And it's proved to give voice to Palestinians as regards how aspects of the, the apartheid state operate for them. Suffer a lot from demolition orders, which came from the Israeli government. It's expected every day that they will demolish and you will lose all your home, you will be homeless. Israeli settlers moved to our land illegally and never left. Now we live meters apart. 
they are our neighbors, but they didn't allow us to live with them so that later we can make some relations. It's not their land, it's controlled by force. I am Al-Mu'tasim Hanarin from Harbat Umm Al-Khair. We have lived and raised our animals and sheep, our language. My grandfather bought it beginning from 60s so that we stay here and we live here from that time till today. We are here suffering from this occupation. We live here. Because they have all of the power, all of the weapons, they can do whatever they want. Nothing will prevent them because they are allowed to live. Anyway, we are not allowed. Even we are the owners of this. There is one law for them, another law for us. Israel State. It's supply all of the settlements with the electricity, with the roads, with the water, with the communication, but we are not allowed to get any of these services. We install solar systems so that we supply people with the renewable energy and we will live with that. We will uh, survive so that every time they don't want anything, we will rebuild again. And we will stay here. If they live in peace, we will live in peace. But it is our right to live in our land. Our existence in our land is our way to protest nonviolently against the occupation. As I feel about this land, it's, it's like my mother, my motherland. I will stay till the last moment of my life, we will stay. Even we are homeless. You know, we will stay in on the land and we come to the sky, we will stay. Okay, um, that's the end of it. I'm not sure how, uh, in core how that the video came across to you, <laughs> but uh, um, but that, yeah, that's basically the report. And certainly, the, it's important. I think the Palestinians have their voice. That's just one aspect, read really, the Bedouin and, and what they're going through. There are uh, many other aspects that I could show videos on, but uh, that's the one for today. But uh, yeah, I'd be just uh, happy to hear what people have to say about uh, the report. Any concerns? Or say any questions you've got? Thanks very much, Gary. Um, can I encourage people to either um, uh, put a question in the chat, type it into the chat box, or um, if you've got the ability to do a raised hand or whatever it is, symbol, try and do that. But obviously I can only see one screen at, at a time. So uh, Linda and John, if you can keep an eye out as well, if you speak questions that I'm, or questioners that I'm missing. Um, there were a couple in the chat, Gary, while you were talking um and james from the locality who was a was suggesting you might want to come and speak to our local united nations association group which is a very active uh, group in in leamington um mo mostly retired folk but um uh they have me me meetings monthly with guest speakers on a range of topics and you know they're very sympathetic to the Palestinian course, I'm sure they would be a, a keen audience. Um, okay. And he was also asking whether you're aware whether the report has been accepted by the UN. Um, that's a good sure. question, which I don't know the answer to. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't know, is the short answer to that, unfortunately. As regards being accepted, I mean, it'll be, it'll be, I'm sure like a lot of governments are saying it's been being read or under consideration 
Um, but as regards to taking any action on that, that's something that Amnesty will obviously be following through because it's, it's very important that the, the UN actually uh, takes action. A lot of the basis of the, the Amnesty report are actually a lot of UN laws, international human rights laws and UN conventions. So it's based on things that have uh, emanated from the United Nations. So one would expect them to actually consider the report and the detail in it, <laughs> the facts in it, and to come to some conclusions about any action. As we know, the UN isn't sort of uh, a nebulous sort of authority organization. It's actually composed of the countries of the world. So uh, what the UN action, what, how the UN responds will largely depend on the response of the international community at the end of the day. Um, but uh, you're right in terms of us seeing what uh, any immediate response there is, and that's something I'll make a note now, is to see what a immediate response there has been. I've seen the response of the UK government, Germany, and Israel, but not the United Nations as an organisation. Thank you. Um, Holly, you, you, you'd put a, a question in there drawing parallels with the situation in uh, Ukraine. Do you want to unmute and... Ask, ask your or make your point. Ask your question. All right, thank you. Um, some of us um, who have been involved with uh, advocacy for Middle East, particularly Palestine, two of our members were part of the Nakba. They were kicked out of Palestine as um, children. Um, anyway, we've been making some parallels to. Um, Ukraine. Here is a country that's just invaded and the, some of it is going to be taken over. Well, what about Palestine? Well, how about what's going on there? We've been talking about it more in social media, etc. Um, thinking about making some uh, articles and papers to draw attention to people as they're so uh, emotionally involved with Ukraine to practice a little expansion of that and look at the devastation of Palestine. Do you hear any uh, comments about that or you see anybody that's making those comparisons? Well, yeah, I think I, I missed the later part of your, your statement, I think, because it, you're breaking up. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I, I got the gist of that, that you've obviously been considering the comparison between the Ukraine and refugee invasion and refugees. And obviously the, the equivalent situation obviously in uh, in the Middle East and Palestine in 48 and in 67, yeah? Yes, but okay. right now, I mean, can we use this opportunity, in a sense, it's an opportunity to put the spotlight also on Palestine, besides it being on uh, Ukraine, say, hey, this is going on right now and has been. Um, look at it because a lot of people don't it doesn't get the media attention at all i know I, I, again you broke up partly but i think i, I think we know what, what theme we're on here I've, I've been watching the i mean the exchange on social media is is very interesting and i'm, I'm sort of glad that it hasn't been all sort of uh, well it's a difficult thing to discuss isn't it because the ukrainian situation is is appalling you know two million people uh, displaced Stay the country for any you, you're breaking up Gary it might might be worth um, knocking off your camera just that might improve the bandwidth if you're hearing me it's frozen. I think we've lost lost Gary for the moment. I'm sure he'll be back very shortly. Um, I can see there were some questions around uh, arms sales and whether we were buying Israeli military supplies as well as selling to them. And I see, uh, and was that part of the Amnesty campaign? Laurie, I don't know if you're connected with Amnesty, but you emphatic yes, you said that, that is part of the Amnesty campaign. Um, don't know if you want to expand on that at all. No, actually, I was referring my yes to the um, person who was making the comment. 
Ah, uh, yeah, okay. And there was an interesting question from Ian about um, does the Israeli embassy have a sort of rebuttal department? Um, I would certainly imagine they do, but I don't know. They'll certainly have a, there'll probably be some kind of euphemism, customer relations or public relations or whatever. But does anybody know? Has anybody had the joy of dealing with the Israeli embassy's PR machine? Seems not. Uh, okay, Let's see if there's any other questions on here. So other colleagues with American accents, you, you're not joining from Ohio, are you? I see somebody mentioning about, uh, you are, gosh. It's very impressive, joys of Zoom. <laughs> so Ohio State has a, has a law that makes um, BDS illegal, is that is that correct? We actually have over 35 states now that have anti-BDS laws in action. We're trying to get them all repealed, but it's a slow moving deal. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's frightening, okay. Nicola Osborne, do you want to say a little bit about this um, RTE piece that you mentioned in the chat? Hi, it's actually uh, John Dolan. I, I was using Nikki's um, okay. getting because I couldn't find my... Um, yeah, it was just I caught it earlier today. Astrid's seen it there in Bumba. Uh, I shared it with you, Astrid. Um, and I, I was so brief, I was running around and I'm sorry I was late today. Um, yeah, there was a there was a, 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 a put MP because it's just easier for Brits. But um, a member of the Irish Parliament in the Doyle um, calling out the government for um, very powerfully too and very very forcefully. Um, and if you can look at RTE Radio Televis Aaron um, mm -hmm. Irish um, the Irish equivalent of BBC or NBC, um, you'll probably still see it. Um, as I said, it was only earlier today. Um, but this guy was uh, was speaking out forcefully. I think that's what it was at the Parliament. I know he's MP, but I, as I say, I want to say briefly. But I did hear all his comments, and 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 he was he was a very powerful speaker. Ireland, of course, as you know, in reference to Ukraine, has I think I was already taken about five and a half thousand refugees uh, from Ukraine, whereas Britain is still designing the application form. I think. Um, and uh, but but yeah, so Ireland uh, a, a very um, Powerful lobby there, it seems, um, and I, I don't know. I don't know Amnesty Ireland whether they uh, this. Maybe Gary has a, a connection there. Maybe there are people with support in in Parliament uh, who would be interested in, you know, in in, in joining us or whatever. Um, but that's what that's what it was. It's uh, certainly worth looking. It's in a couple of minutes. It's a statement kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's what it was. So it's by, uh, by from John alias Nikki. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not buying, but, I'm still here. but that was the point. Thanks very much for that. Um, interesting comment from John Goodman in the chat as well about um, using apartheid in a non-South African context. Um, I think five years ago, I might have felt the same way. I, like a lot of you, I, I'm sure I, I was involved in the anti-apartheid struggle um to you know to try and support black south africans getting equal rights in south africa and at first it did feel wrong but actually it's it, there is a legal definition as the report states and that was the whole thrust of this amnesty report is to is to evidence the fact that the israeli added actions absolutely justifies the terminology so i think i think we can use that um be interesting to, to work out what the Hebrew is for uh, apartheid and use that perhaps, but because uh, apartheid is a sort of Afrikaans word, I think, which I remember reading something that 
broke it down into two English words apart, hate, which is not what it means, but um, I thought actually that kind of sums it up. Um, and um, so I, I know where you're coming from that, John. I don't know if you want to say any more about it, but I, and it would be interesting to know what South African comrades think. Um, or if there's any Hebrew speakers online here who know what the uh, Hebrew for apartheid would be. Belinda, did you have a, a question? A yeah, point? first of all, there were two Belinda Pikes in this meeting. <laughs> Sounds like, uh, anyway, a quote from something else because I gave somebody my, oh, Gary's coming back. I had to give someone my link to get in. Um, I was actually going to um, make the point that I think John Goodman's making, which is um, a lot of people, I think, when they've heard um, people using the term apartheid to describe what's happening um, in Israel-Palestine, assume it's a link, it's making a comparison with South Africa and then make those comparisons. But I think, um, as is well explained in the report, but perhaps most of us aren't really fully aware, it's now an international legal definition as conventions. And that's the test against which, which Amnesty is applying to what the situation in Israel, Palestine, it's not about you know, how much it's like um, South Africa, but I think that's something which, you know, part of the campaign has to be to educate people to realize that there are these um, conventions now, different bits of international law, um, which define apartheid, which is sort of like, it, where it's moved on from, from South Africa. So I think that's one to remember. There was something else I was going to say, but it's gone straight out of my head. Um, it'll come back to me too late. Okay, thanks. Andy, you are, you are muted. Yep. <laughs> thanks, John. Um, Gary, welcome back. Um, just, uh, just to sort of say, you probably picked up on the back end of that. There was a question around... Um, using the term apartheid to describe a context other than the South African context in which it was sort of coined. Um, and Belinda's just explained that there is now a, a proper legal, internationally recognised legal definition, and that's what the report demonstrates Israel meets, and then some. Um, but have you, as Amnesty, or do you know if anybody has spoken to the ANC or anybody in South Africa to to sort of get their take on whether they're comfortable with apartheid being used as a term to describe the situation in other territories. But you're on you're on mute as well. Oh, I'm okay now, right, sorry. <laughs> I had to crash in through the back door to get back here. Um, I'm not aware of any direct contacts with, with South Africa. I mean, uh, over the years, South Africa has been quite sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. As we know, Mandela's famous uh, statement about nobody being free until Palestine, the Palestinians were. So there's always been a great sympathy. As regards the use of the term apartheid, I mean, Amnesty certainly sees it as a term which is internationally available um, and there um, if, it, if this situation is identified. So it's not something that South Africa would have a, uh, an A say on, um, on whether we used it or not. So we wouldn't be asking their permission. There may have been contacts. Obviously, we've got uh, issues with South Africa with human rights as well. So we have contacts there. Um, there will have been discussions, I'm sure, um, but they won't have been in nature in terms of conferring whether amnesty could do what they're, they're doing, because apartheid isn't specifically a thing that it. it so the South African conditions fulfilled the conditions for, for being seen as apartheid, but also a Palestine Israel does now. So it's a separate thing, really. And what Amnesty is trying to avoid is actually making comparisons with the South African situation. Um, so I'm not aware that there's been any uh, direct consultations with such uh, with South Africa um, on this report. And I think I've frozen again. Um. Not for me, I haven't. I don't no, know. No, okay. It was sorry, right. everything went blank. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, thanks oh, for that. Yeah, thank yeah. that. Uh, just trying to see if there's any other questions in the chat, or does anybody has anybody got their hand raised? John. Um, yeah, Andy, and I hope by the way that for those who wanted it, the live transcript is now working for them. It took me a long while to uh, sort it out, but it, but it is now working. Um, 
uh, and I was because I was a bit distracted by that, I may have missed something. So I apologize if my question duplicates something already covered. But there was, I heard quite a bit of mention in the discussion about uh, uh, Ukraine. And, and, and I wonder whether um, the, the, the irony of, um, of uh, the Ukraine situation um, is, is lost, I think, on many uh, Israelis. Um, the fact that even our prime minister is is calling for um, P Putin and his associates to be referred to the International Criminal Court, whereas previously he had rubbished the idea that um, uh, Israel and indeed um, uh, the Israeli government, well, or people in the Israeli government and people in Hamas should be referred to the um, International Criminal Court. Um, I wonder if it will actually, once the Ukraine conflict is over, um, whether it will be easier to get people to see the similarities between what Israel has done in Palestine uh, with what Russia has done in U Ukraine. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to think that this is, can be seen as an opportunity, that it is uh, a diversion at this point in time. A lot of people are quite understandably uh, very concerned and anxious and distressed by what they're seeing in the Ukraine, but it is an opportunity to subtly, obviously I think you can, one can overplay it in terms of throwing Palestine down people's throats at this point in time, but certainly introducing the parallels on a, on a, a drip by drip basis. Um, and as things calm down or stabilize to I mean, whichever way they go, um, that that is maintained and that at some point, um, we can try to to insert the Palestinian Israel situation and certainly the apartheid report um, to get it considered in a different light uh, as a result of Ukraine. We have to remain out, so uh, it turns out. But certainly with the ICC, I'm referring people to the ICC, as we know, unfortunately, countries uh, tend to like it or dislike it, depending on who's being referred um, to it, and particularly if they're being referred themselves. So. There's another uh, parallel, which is that um, there's an awful lot of um, Russians with some, in some cases, pretty tenuous connection to Judaism now living in, in Israel. Um, so um, the Ukrainians are, are also uh, begin to experience the, um, well, I suppose they're only getting the, the military uh, rather than any Russian sort of civilian uh, migration, but um, there is that dimension as well. Um, it's, it's a very interesting mix that Israel's introducing into its uh, its country at the moment. So. Yeah. Uh, there was a question, Gary, earlier on around arms sales and whether Britain buys stuff from Israeli um, arms manufacturers and whether, as well as selling to them, and is that part of the campaign to try and get that two-way trade stopped? I could see it was a company. Yeah, the arms, the arms trade, yeah, between us and Israel, basically, with whatever we're purchasing. I'm, I'm not sure the detail, a lot of the information that I've got is, is about what we've been trying to sell, yeah. uh, which is many parts and uh, other aspects, technology, etc. Um, but certainly it would apply to anything incoming from uh, Israel as well with the apartheid situation, not, not wanting to, to, to support the state, not necessarily asking for a boycott, because that's not Amnesty's tack. Um, but certainly not supplying things to uh, an apartheid situation where they're used mm -hmm. to control movement to actually become part of any military hardware which might be inflicted on the Palestinians. Certainly we've got a responsibility to make sure we're not contributing to that. Buying things back is a sort of a secondary aspect that uh, should be looked at, but, um, mm -hmm. but certainly the arms, the arms trade is something that Amnesty has been, been shouting about for some time with Israel. It would certainly be I think it. I mean, I think it's good to use the term apartheid because if we can start to do a kind of boycott campaign that um, the anti-apartheid movement succeeded in creating against apartheid South Africa, uh, that would be very powerful. And uh, yeah, I mean, chuck Israel out of Eurovision, you know, stop them supporting things. No, I mean it's it's kind of frivolous, but um, yeah, it, psychologically, there's an impact. I think if they're made to feel like pariahs. Um, uh, I suppose what would be good is if you could see a slow motion form of what's happening with Russia where everything's being ripped out of them and uh, denied yeah. them very almost overnight. Um, and the impact has that been so rapid that it's going to maybe take weeks or months for some of that to kick in. 
but you could slow drip things. And hopefully, as I say, with the slow process, the long process that, that Amnesty sees with this campaign, that over a period of time, uh, people will start to, to withdraw in some way. And that's mm-hmm. certainly been the aim with businesses. Um, you know, there are well, you know, wanting two businesses to withdraw. And so we know with the BDS as well that um, that's it's been successful in getting certain companies, not to say it's been worth their while, that they're relatively small operations in Israel and settlements. Uh, should actually impede the, their larger operations worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anybody got any more questions that they want to ask? Just trying to see if there's any hands raised. Not seeing any. Or have I missed it? Yeah. Um, go ahead, uh, Nicola. <laughs> like to you. Hi, I'm the real Nicola. Yes. <laughs> Just to say that, you know, also before the report, of course, there was the report on JCB. Yes. Yeah. And and I think the Bourneville Amnesty Group, we're planning to do a demonstration or some kind of action outside JCP headquarters. And, and I just wondered whether there'd be other people here who might consider coming to join us. We haven't actually fixed a date yet. <clears throat> Um, but but that's what we're planning to do, really, ready to raise awareness. Mm-hmm. So this is their HQ in Staffordshire. They are in Utokota. Yeah. 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 It's certainly still very relevant to ACB, and obviously you can tack on the apartheid uh, agenda to it as well now. So it just adds to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, there's certainly some very powerful images of JCB diggers demolishing. Palestinian properties and so on. Um, scandalous, really. Um, thanks for that. Let, let us know when it is, Nicola, and we might yes. get a car together. Um, okay. Any more for any more? We're just, yep. And James, go ahead, please. You, you just unmuted and muted yourself again. Um, in terms of Israeli rebuttal, we know that it will um, <laughs> make a big play of anti-Semitism, mm. which, you know, wasn't the case in South Africa. Mm. And I just wonder if anybody has a, a very neat way of reinforcing what what is always said, which is it's not about anti-Semitism, it's about the Israeli state. Um, I'm, I'm always looking for arguments for people who produce the anti-Semitism argument. I haven't got a clean and quick one. I mean, it is it is about the Israeli state. You know, Amnesty recognizes Israel as being a state as part of the UN, which therefore gives it obligations under international human rights laws. Um, but uh, as regards anti-Semitism, um, I usually ask people, my, my, my strategy is actually to ask people the question back, which is, what, what do you mean? What is anti-Semitic in, in what's been said? Because quite often people use the term quite willy-nilly and they don't really fully understand what it means. And, you know, oh, it's against the Jews, you know. <laughs> so you, you can actually break it down. It's, I think the thing is to ask questions back to people um, you know, what they mean by that and, and why is actually criticizing the use of bulldozers to demolish homes to, to uh, you know, control people's movements, to uh, imprison them without charge for six months, a year, two years. Why is that? Why is that what is anti-Semitic about that? Like you, you, just to, to throw it back, really, not go on beyond the def- defensive. As soon as it says the phrase anti-Semitic, don't, don't freeze, just go back at them and say, what do you mean? Why? What aspects? Well, what about you can then give out your facts in terms of, say, the aspects of apartheid and what is anti-Semitic about criticising those abuses? Mm. Thank you. Sounds like a good strategy. I'm not seeing any other hands raised or comments in the chat. Oh, yeah. Holly, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Will the uh, slides be available on your site? It's already there. I, I, I didn't realize <laughs> they'd already put it up because normally it's it's my presentation. It's one I've created, but this one is actually being created from the office. So it's actually there. 
again, as I say, go into AI UK, IOPT, you know, Israel, Palestine, and into the resource site, and it's there. Without my videos, I have to say, without the two videos, but yeah. Just to add, I put a link to the resources site in the chat because I find the Amnesty website, I mean, once you've found where you want to go, it's fine, but yeah. getting there, I, I, I kept, you know, the last few days, kept not being able to find the report. So I put into the chat, A, the general resources thing, but also the link to the 90 minute course, which Gary mentioned, because Amnesty has what they call a Human Rights Academy, which I didn't know about until quite recently. So it's worth looking at that material. The link's in the chat. Mm. With the AIO case, so I say it's always best to start with what we do. Everything is under what we do, really, the campaigns. Okay. Um, is there anything um, our colleagues in uh, the US want to share with us? It's great that you're doing that uh, anti-Israeli anti, uh, apartheid activity or anti uh, Israel, you mentioned you, you're trying to get the um, the law against BDS um, repealed, but what sort of things are you, what sort of activities are you, are you putting on or doing? I think that was Ohio, if they're still with us. <laughs> All right. Well, um, is there anything we want to? There, there's one thing that uh, I don't know if it applies, uh, how else it applies, but here in the Cuyahoga County, Ohio, up mm -hmm. along Great Lakes, um, there's a, we happen to buy a lot of Israeli bonds, our government, our county mm -hmm. system, and so does the state of Ohio, even mm -hmm. at lower rates of return than other investments. So we have, and of course there's you know, various bills to prohibit protest and free speech, change them around at the, at the uh, capital, at, at the capital of Ohio, that's Columbus and in the county, uh, Cuyahoga. So we're watching some of those things. Of course, of course in the United States, there's a overall pressure, red pressure to silence everything about everybody, you know. So we're really caught between a lot of things and we're making as many kind of comparisons as possible. Yes, if you if you say anything uh, about Israel that is supposedly anti-Semitic, you can be fined and, and go to jail. I mean, silly, you know, your First Amendment rights has less import than Israel. So um, it's kind of reverse colonization, right? Anyway, um, those are some things that we're looking into. How are the um, state and municipal governments investing? Yeah, that's very interesting. Here, the campaign's more around sort of pension funds and things, but I, I've never really thought of, uh, I don't know whether our local authorities invest other than their pension pots, but... Um, yeah, interesting angle. Thanks for that. Can, can I just ask, I didn't hear, what was it you said? There were a lot of Israeli somethings. Bonds. B -O -N -D. Oh, bonds, bonds, right, investment bonds. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just a reminder in case anybody on here hasn't spotted this. Unfortunately, our um, meeting with Brian Klug, Dr. Brian Klug from Oxford University on the Jerusalem Declaration on Antisemitism is not now going to go ahead um, because he, it's too close to a, a house move that he's uh, doing um, but we hope to reschedule it possibly on zoom and it's great to see it as a big audience for this one so we'll uh, make sure to promote it and make sure amnesty know about it as well because you can obviously pull in a, a, a great audience uh, from many countries so um, thanks for that um, and I um, don't think we've got any other things in the pipeline Belinda the vigil obviously um, Next month, is there anything else you want to draw? Yeah, just um, a yes, our usual monthly vigil will take place this coming Saturday, the the nineteenth, um, outside Leamington Town Hall, um, eleven till twelve, and again on th it's th always the third um, Saturday of the month. So the next one will be on Easter Saturday. And just a reminder of the medical aid for 
Palestinians fundraising party that we'll have on the 30th of April. Uh, we'll have a, um, a speaker coming up from MAP and we also have another speaker who will reveal later. Do come along, it's a chance to have Palestinian food um, and to raise money for a very good cause. Um, the, if, you, you, if you're on our mailing list, you'll have seen the information about how to get tickets. It's also on our Facebook thing or otherwise just email us on Justice of Palestinians um, at google.com. Thanks for that. And is there anybody from the Mid Warwickshire Amnesty Group who wants to plug anything that you're up to? Great. The human right to dinner has been uh, has been uh, upheld. Um, so, um, without further ado, just let me thank you all for um, attending tonight, and particularly Gary. That was a great presentation, uh, and uh, you know some really important insights and, and, and useful answers to um, to questions and thanks for such a lively discussion everybody and um, we hope to see you again soon on the next one all right thank you very much cheers thank you bye bye bye, bye.